so we've one more to go before we pause up. Uh, Laura has the misfortune of being my friend. Um, so since she found out I was emceeing, she just assumed this was going to turn into a roast. Um, but that's not what today's about. So instead, I'm just going to embarrass her a little bit and let you all know to congratulate her because Laura got promoted last month. Yep, very well deserved. Um, so I'm, I'm promise not going to say anything else. So yeah, Laura is going to talk to us about something I definitely want to learn about because I am a lazy engineer and how to make things better. And uh, if I can say that we know Laura is definitely an impressive engineer because more than anyone, she has to do it with broken fingers. So I'll just end on that. Uh, hi, Sorry, Laura. Hi folks, uh, as Danielle said, my name is Laura Kelly. Uh, just to check, everybody can hear me okay? Perfect. Um, the context around the broken fingers is the fact that I'm a goalkeeper and I break my fingers regularly throughout the year, which as a software engineer, you can imagine is not very useful. But um, I'm here today to talk a little bit about operational health and I'm the lazy engineer whose guide this is. Uh, I'll get a little bit, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but I'll start off just first of all about why do I personally care about operational health? So I have to explain this reference, I think, because not a lot of people know who Smokey the Bear is. Smokey the Bear was, it was a long running US campaign about uh, only you can prevent forest fires. Um, but I'm here today to say that only you can prevent customer escalations and outages. Um, so, so many customer events and outages are so preventable and they're repeatable. And the biggest issue is the fact that they escalate beyond their original scope. The biggest culprit there is a lack of visibility into operational health. It, nothing annoys me quite as much as seeing an alert come up and come up again and come up again. I'm like, why has this not been fixed? So this is why I particularly wanted to talk about this today. So we have a weekly um, operational metrics meeting as part of our team. And it's about, between about four or five different teams in work. And what we found is the services that were going down the most often were the services had the least visibility. They were the services that were bringing in the most SIs, the most customer support tickets and producing the most defects. It's an issue that's completely related and it's all intrinsically going back to operational health. So this is probably a more appropriate title to my talk over um, a lazy engineer's rant on the importance of operational health and monitoring your stuff. There's a different S word I could use there. Um, but this is normally the last slide of a talk, but it's my turn to ask you some questions today. So I want just a, a show of hands. Who here is a stakeholder of code deployed in the cloud right now? Sweet, we've got a good few people. How is that code performing? I don't need you to answer right. I just want you to think about this. How is your code performing right now? I'm well aware of the fact that this is a Saturday and nobody has their work laptops in front of them. But if I asked you this question at about half 10 on a Monday morning, would you know the answer? How long would it take you to find that answer out? Where are you going to look for that information? If you have a Lambda deployed in the cloud, Chloe already talked about Lambdas today, how many invocations are you getting per day? What's the average length of your invocation? How many errors are you getting? If you have a Kubernetes service or a cluster running right now, how many nodes, how many pods do you have running? If you have gateway traffic, what's your ingress look like? What's your distribution of traffic? What's it look like throughout the day? Um, anybody here who's in database management, do you have any replicas up right now? What's your memory usage look, look like? For any services you have running in general, what does your CPU and memory uses look like? How many errors are you getting per day? These are all questions that if you're a stakeholder in the code in the cloud, you should know the answer to these. And if you're in work and if I ask you that question, really you should know that answer within two to three minutes. So many people, if you ask them that question, they'll be like, I'll get back to you in half an hour, which no harm is not good enough. So I wanna go into understanding operational health first of all. So the purpose of operational health is to define, capture, and analyze metrics to gain visibility into operational activities so you can take appropriate action. There's a lot to unpack there. We'll go through it step by step. So first of all, I wanna talk about operational activities. So what actually are operational activities? So operational activities help to grow an organization in some way, either through selling things to customers, finding ways to improve products, or profits, sorry, on ensuring optimal daily operations. The key word there is optimal. I'm a software engineer. People think that my job and what I'm paid for every day is to write code. That is incorrect. I am paid to write good, maintainable, working code. You can pick any random person off the street, give them generative AI and internet connection and enough money and they will write you code, but it will not work. 
And this is the, where we still need the human factor in how the data, uh, data industry and how AI is changing tech. Everybody in this room is a highly skilled professional. You're all very, very intelligent people. You have a wealth of experience and knowledge and expertise that are why your companies pay you for your job. And we all know that if your job's not necessary, your company will get rid of you. An operational activity is anything your company pays you for that ensures that their day-to-day -day operations are still happening. So I want you to think about that. Keep in mind, what do you do every day? Are you in project management? Are you working with teams? Are there deliverables you're keeping track of? If you're an engineer, what infrastructure do you manage? How do you keep it healthy? I want you to think about those as we progress through this. So going back to our original definition here, I want to talk about defining metrics now. So defining metrics, what visibility do I want and what do I want to specifically keep track of? So you can't improve what you don't measure. This is kind of already mentioned today. This is a favorite quote of my football manager, generally shouted at me when my hands are on my knees and I'm really ready to throw up because we're doing fitness testing. It's often uh, um, attributed to Peter Drucker, but pretty much it comes down to this. If you can't measure it, how do you expect to be able to improve it? I talked earlier on about optimal daily operations. It's not enough now that code works. It has to be faster, cheaper, more reliable, more robust than ever before. So you have to identify areas for improvement in your code and in any part of your job. How do you do that if you don't have visibility into what's working and what's not working? So what metrics are gonna be useful? Depending on your role and depending on your operational activities, these are gonna change. But some ideas for you is anyway, things like velocity and throughput, um, goals and key results tracking, if you have any OKRs or any particular objectives as a company, these are gonna be useful. Um, quality and defects, how many defects are you getting in, what's the rate of them, how quickly is it taking you to actually remediate and fix some of these defects. Um, test coverage, uh, you can break this down and further into unit tests, integration, smoke tests, whatever it may be. What percentage code, code, code coverage are you at right now in terms of testing? Code vulnerabilities, I'm gonna give Rapid7 a plug here, we're in cybersecurity, everything has to be as secure as possible. Um, we're always concerned about where are we bringing in vulnerabilities in our code in terms of external dependencies? How long does it take us to remediate them? How does it take us to identify them in the first place? Um, and infrastructure and health availability. I've asked some of these questions already today, but it could be any, any one of these particular metrics. You will know yourselves what numbers are gonna be key to you in actually measuring how well are you doing right now? How well are your services doing right now? But I say there's just a couple of ideas there anyway. We'll go back to this again. So we've got numbers now. We've established what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We've established on what kind of metrics are gonna be useful for you in terms of defining your success. Now we want to analyze the metrics to gain visibility. This is where I have somewhat of an obsession with metric visibility, in particular, dashboards. Um, so anybody who walks past my desk and works knows that I love a good dashboard. Um, there's a number of different tools I've referenced here. It's Dynatrace, Datadog, Grafana, Kibana, New Relic, AWS CloudWatch. I picked the top six off Google for this. There are a whole host of tooling that you can use for data visualization. Personally, I'm a big fan of Datadog. It's what we use in work, so it's what I'm gonna use for the rest of this presentation. But figure out what tool works best for you in terms of infrastructure monitoring. Again, I love a good quote. This is often attributed to Bill Gates, although similar quotes have kind of cropped up since the early 1920s. But it's, I choose a lazy person to do a hard job because a lazy person will find an easy way to do it. I am that lazy person. I despise putting unnecessary effort into things. Don't get me wrong, I go to work every day, I work hard, I put the effort in, but I hate putting effort into things that are not serving me or are not serving my team. So this is where I want you to really think now about optimizing your workflows and optimizing operational metrics in general. So this is a typical dashboard. It's got all the pretty colors, the graphs, there's a couple of numbers there. Um, but at a glance, I cannot tell you is this service healthy right now and I monitor this dashboard every day. It has a purpose. There's some really useful information, some really useful data in there. But to be honest, it takes effort to read it and it's effort that I'm not willing to expend every single day. If you're depending on this dashboard to monitor your services, your service will be healthy for two days and then you're never gonna know again. This is what I would call a debug dashboard. I will read this dashboard, I will go looking at it, but only if I'm actively investigating an issue right now and want to correlate events. Instead, what I prefer is a nice green wall. So I can tell you right now, just at a quick glance, everything is healthy here. And the trick to this is visual formatting and conditional formatting. 
I know for this particular Kubernetes service that anything below about 60% in terms of CPU and memory utilization is healthy enough. If it goes between about 60 and 80, I need to start thinking about scaling it in the next couple of weeks. If it goes above 80, I'm just gonna start having issues. So this is where I start to think about how can I use color and how can I use quick glances to help me uh, visualize and monitor my services. This is what I would call an overview dashboard. And I have about 30 of these that I look at every single day and it takes me up no more than about two minutes max. So I've already referenced my desk. This is my desk and work. As you can clearly see, Rapid7 are still hot desking by how lived in this is. And I'm gonna thank my intern for the party possum in the corner that keeps me uh, company every day. But um, I work off my top two main monitors all the time. It's better for your posture, your eye line and whatnot. But I always have my dashboards on my laptop screen in front of me, right in my eye line. And if I have, about, and you can kind of see there, even in terms of the Chrome tabs, there's about 30 tabs open there. I have a little Chrome extension that every five seconds a new dashboard appears. And if this is green all the time, great. I have nothing to worry about. I'm never putting active effort into monitoring my services or monitoring what my team owns. It's just a case, is it in my eyeline? So I'm gonna give you an example of this in terms of like how I then spot where things are going wrong. So going back to this original service, uh, everything's green, it's good, it's fine. Oh wait, it's not. I'm programming away, I'm doing whatever it is my operational activities include, and I see some red out of the corner of my eye. And depending on obviously color blindness and whatnot, you can choose whatever colors you like for this. And I'm going, oh wait, this is something I need to address. I have zero pods running here. I need to go and restart some pods, restart some nodes, check the logs, figure out what's actually happening here. This helps me get ahead of a potential outage and helps me identify where outages are coming in before a customer is telling me where outages are coming in. Um, this is one example of how you can really start to get ahead of the problems and get ahead of any pain that your customers might be feeling and address them as soon as possible. This is a similar dashboard. Again, it's a green wall, but we've got two examples here of how operational metrics and dashboards can really help you. So the first one here is at the top in region four. This is for a DynamoDB uh, table, by the way, where um, we want uh, our, all of our services to read off the index. We don't want them reading off the main table just because we've done some interesting things with projections. Uh, and I've noticed that there's something here is reading from my main table. This isn't an outage. This isn't something that's affecting customers right now, but this is something that will cause data inconsistency issues. We're in an industry, and there's been a lot of talk about data today already, where data is key. It is so, so valuable. The second that your customers start doubting your data and start to having some distrust with your data, this is the second that that customer company or customer product relationship starts to break down. So I wanna get ahead of this. I want to look at my logs, I want to see who's reading off the main table, reach out to whatever engineer that is and say, look, do you mind reading off the index? This is gonna be a lot, a lot better in terms of data consistency for you. This is something that potentially you wouldn't see for days, weeks, months later until a customer comes to you and says, I'm seeing potentially documents that are deleted here when I shouldn't be seeing documents that are deleted. Why is this happening? This is cutting down on, again, customer pain. It's building more customer trust, but it also means that your engineers have less data inconsistency problems to deal with further down the line. It's all about getting ahead of issues before they become problems. Similar with the, the yellow cell that I have here in the bottom right, this is where I'm getting some right throttles. So again, this is a yellow one because I know myself that in our services, our Dynamo client has plenty of retries built in. So it may have just got throttled a little bit while we were scaling up our capacity, but it might've been fine. I still wanna check that though. I'm gonna go check logs. I'm gonna go check my DLQ to see do I have any messages there. But again, this is all about data inconsistency issues. I could have not noticed this. It could have went unchecked. There could be messages in a DLQ. We could get data loss. There could be broken pipeline somewhere. I want to figure out what's causing this issue. Is it okay? Is it not okay? I do not want my customer to be telling me this is not okay. This is what this is all about, is preventing customer issues and preventing disruptive customer issues, breaking your workflow further down the line. Monitoring notifications is another part of, cost of uh, metric visibility. Um, this is where um, I want to talk about monitoring for a little bit in terms of a subset of metric visibility. And it involves keeping track of important metrics so that anomalies, errors, etc., are noticeable immediately. Um, so for example, whenever I had the pre uh, one of the previous dashboards up, when I talked about zero pods running, it's really nice to be able to see that on the dashboard, but there's times you're going to be in meetings, there's times that you're going to be you know, on the weekends, not everybody's working 24 seven. If you are, please don't, take your own personal time. But there's, there's times where you're not actively looking at your dashboards and there's things you need to know about that a little bit sooner. 
Um, some examples of this, you could, again, you could have messages on a DLQ. Um, there could be a number of uh, pods or instances that goes below a healthy level. Um, you could have scheduled jobs that have failed. Uh, you could have a high number of or high volume of errors in a very short space of time. You could have throttling for gateways or for ingress traffic. And again, you could have memory and CPU usage that is above a, a healthy threshold. These are all things that you kind of want to know about sooner rather than later. There are certain things that, you know, they're fine leaving them to, to deal with, to create a ticket and whatnot. There's other things you need to know about right now. I would like to point out, though, not all monitors need to be immediately disruptive. Immediately visible, yes, but not necessarily disruptive. So this is where I have two examples here where one monitor, I want to know about it soon, but it's okay if I leave it a few hours before addressing it. Uh, the other monitor is one that I want to know about right now and get on top of that as soon as possible. So you have a scheduled batch ingestion job. It can fail in the middle of the night. Um, it's visible, but it doesn't require an immediate disruption or an immediate reaction right now. If a job fails at 3 a.m. and it's fine for me to run it at 10 a.m., I do not want to be called in the middle of the night. I value my sleep far too much for that. Um, I, anybody who here has ever been on an on-call rotation, the, for us it's pager duty, but whatever uh, tool you use for that, that notification sound is absolutely awful. I despise it. I do not want to hear it in the middle of the night if it's something that we wait to the morning. For this first alert, what we would personally do is if you're using Datadog, they provide different integrations with email, with Slack, with text notifications, whatever it may be. I want to receive a Slack notification whenever I come in first thing in the morning to say, you need to rerun this job. Brilliant. The second one here is zero successful requests to a customer facing API in 10 minutes. This should be addressed as soon as possible. This is something that's actively causing your customer pain right now. This is something I don't mind being waking up for at 3 a.m. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm going to take a lie in after that, but it needs to be addressed right now. That's where you get engineers or whoever it may be, support engineers, DevOps, whatever it may be, up in the middle of the night to fix a problem right now. If it can wait a few hours, do not waken people up in the middle of the night for this. This is a personal gripe that I have. <laughs> so we'll go back to our definition for the last little bit here, and I've kind of already hinted on this a little bit. So the purpose of operational health in general and the visibility into it is so that you can take appropriate action. What now? You've got the alert. You've seen the sales not quite right in the dashboard. What are you doing about it? Well. I was asked a question once, in fact, actually it was Danielle asked me this question in an intern panel once, is what happens if you break something? You fix it. So you create a ticket, you fix the problem, and you fix it for good. I said about this earlier on, there's nothing annoys me more than fixing the same problem more than once, than putting unnecessary effort into a system that's not serving me. And it's actually the fuel for this talk in general, is that I do not want to see the same alert come up more than once. If you see something come up and it's not immediately causing your customers pain right now, create a ticket, prioritize the ticket, and complete the ticket. I, I'm on an on-call notification, I'm on every eight weeks. I'm going to be seriously pissed off if the, I see the same alerts from eight weeks ago come up whenever I'm next on, on rotation. This is what's immediately disruptive to your engineers or to whoever's on call, is that if you're having to deal with an issue right now because it's causing customers so much pain, why didn't you deal with it six weeks ago when the monitor first came up? You can, you can plan and prioritize your fixes without it having to be your boss's boss's boss breathing down your neck because 16 customers have complained to him about it. This is where the prioritization and being a lazy engineer is really, really useful because be the lazy engineer who avoids the unnecessary effort of fixing a problem more than once. Do it for yourself, do it for your teammates, do it for whatever's keeping you, or whatever's keeping you in this industry. It'll be better for your customers and better for you in the long run. Right, now it's your turn to ask the questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Me on? Okay. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Your talk's been really interesting. Um, so my question is, this is something that I have seen a little bit about and seen a little bit of news, but where can I go to learn more? And what can I, where can I find what good looks like? So uh, that's going to be, uh, there's going to be a number of different resources there. I would say talk to people in the industry who are experienced in this, in terms of like talk to folks who today, if they put their hands up in terms of being a stakeholder and code in the cloud, they'll have faced these problems before. Um, uh, cloud providers normally are a really good source of information too. So 
So actually, the quote about operational health came directly from AWS. Um, the likes of uh, AWS, Azure, um, Google, they're all going to be really good sources in terms of what does operational health look like, what are some like inbuilt metrics and whatnot that you can see. Um, feel free to chat to me afterwards. But generally, a good Google search will give you like an indication as to what other people are doing and, and again, find what system works for you. So, for example, um, I was uh, chatting to a couple of engineers in my team about this yesterday and the, the dashboards being in my eye line really helps me every day. Um, for another engineer in my team, it's super distracting for her actually, and it actually takes away from what she's doing right now. So in terms of you personally monitoring operational health, it's going to be a trial and error kind of system. But feel free to like reach out, ask questions, and again, a, a good Google search is going to be a good starting point there. Any more? I'm old enough that when we were doing this, we had a shared BlackBerry, because you know, pager duty didn't exist when I started doing it. So yeah, when you wanted the well-paid Christmas on call, you had to go to somebody's house to get the Blackberry. Mm -hmm. All right, got a good holiday out of it. <laughs> Sorry, where were the hands over here? Thank you. Just while I fill and walk. Thank you for your talk, Laura. Yeah. Reaching peak laziness, considering you have all your observability in place, I'm wondering, do you have any auto remediation strategies for recurring issues? So yes, some of the issues you will see will be self-resolving. So it's, it's pretty easy to say if you have a dynamo table that's been throttled constantly, implement an auto-scaling policy. Auto-scaling policies, you'll pretty much find them for every piece of cloud infrastructure out there possible. Um, so they're always going to be a good issue in terms of the, even preventing the monitor hopping from the first place. If you've been constantly throttled, up your capacity, have an auto-scaling policy in place. Um, in you really want to try actually and avoid the issues coming up in the first place. So I would tend to actually avoid auto resolving issues because that's something that never required my attention in the first place and shouldn't have bothered me at all. So it's a try and avoid the auto resolving issues, get to the root of it, fix it once and forget about it would be the way I would say to achieve peak laziness is to not have to think about it at all. Cool. Any more? Yeah, absolutely. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, when you, you were saying there earlier about the, the lazy thing, mm -hmm. um, lazy engineers, or be, to be lazy, you know, to not fix unnecessary problems. And I was actually just curious, um, as, as an engineer yourself, do you place any sort of significance or importance on creativity in engineering? And like, what specifically would that be, say, amongst your team? Absolutely, I place massive significance on, cre on creativity. Um, that's I, I actually think the two things kind of go hand in hand. Is because I want I want to be the lazy engineer who's creative enough to think of the easiest solution there. So that's what kind of where I would place that. Um, I personally work on a team of massively creative engineers, and I can see a few of them here already. But um, that's where you're going to having that diverse perspective and the diversity, even in terms of different types of creativity, is going to be massively important for engineer, any engineering team. Um, the be, my favorite thing ever is sitting down with a group of engineers and thinking of the one thing that makes everybody go, us go, ah, damn, didn't think of that. That's my favorite part of my job, actually, is annoying people and putting the cat among the pigeons. Um, so yes, the crea creativity in engineering is massively important. I put huge stock in that. I say, I think, yeah, those two things do go hand in hand in terms of be creatively lazy is the best way I put it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hi, Laura. It was a very interesting session. So in my previous job, we had similar kind of operational part where we, had, we were managing a subscriber database. And uh, the operational part was showing certain things, which is basically monitoring the health of the database. Uh, the most of the issues we face on the scalability and whenever it goes to the very higher load, uh, how the system behave. So there are two aspects. One is the operational metrics and the vis visualization which the operational system is providing. But there is a part of it like it is showing, uh, you might get the same kind of errors because the actual problem lies in the system you are monitoring. So uh, and many times it happens that it is something out of your team's control like the system you are monitoring that needs to be fixed. So how do you deal with those kind of scenarios uh, where something is out of your control and uh, you have to deal with uh, those issues in some different forms of errors and uh, the metrics going wrong, actually? So the best thing I can say there is complain. Um, different companies will have different processes for this. I know personally in Rapid7, I can create a ticket for another team to do. 
I can assign another team to a ticket. If it's causing you pain and it's disruptive in your operational activities, the company's losing value out of your time there. So that's where you need to start pushing to say, right, this, this upstream uh, service, this upstream database is causing me issues. You actively need to sort this right now because it is going to cause us more problems down the line. Um, speaking up, and I know it's, it's hard depending on the setting and depending on the company, but speaking up and genuinely being a pain in the backside to people to say, please fix this, please fix this, please fix this, is the best way to go about that. But yeah, absolutely, there's going to be times where if, if it is a database and it's getting massively spiky thr um, traffic, where sometimes you have to take a look and say, right, the, the, the laziest thing to do here is actually putting in the most work to completely switch out what type of database we're using. You could be going from a SQL database to a NoSQL database. It could be doing an upgrade, whatever it may be. Not all of these fixes are going to be quick. Not all of them are going to be simple, but it's all about having long-term maintainability is the priority here. So if it's another team's causing the issue and it's causing problems with your particular metrics, complain and be a pain in the backside. Brilliant. Any more? Weddings. Oh, I don't mind. Is it Kira? Yeah. You're making me come all the way back down. <laughs> Is there anybody else up here before I go back down? That's okay. Yeah. I'll come to you next. All right. Sorry. Uh, I'm just going to well, prioritize well, well, this. I'm last before lunch. Everybody wants to eat. I know. So and I said I wanted the steps, but I also want to be practical about them. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. So my question is, like, I'm a big fan of the whole fix problem once, and it's like, even if I'm doing QA testing, I'll even go beyond what's listed in the problems. If I see something, I'll still fix it, because I know it'll come back in the next round of testing. But what happens if the problem that keeps being repeated is outside of your control? So for example, I worked recently with like content management systems, mm. and I've had a lot of problems of the client making an issue where they put in the wrong URL link. <laughs> Mm. And I've had the same problem repeated and then had to go and tell them, this is how you fix that. So how do you deal with it if the repeated problem's outside of your control? I think it comes down to collaboration. Um, like a big fan of breaking down silos. Um, there's loads of folks in here today from project management, from UX, engineering, quality, um, quality testing, whatever it may be. It's getting talking to folks. And if it's a case that it's a customer putting in the wrong input all the time, that's something that we need to bring to user experience, say, right, do we need a better documentation? Do we need better tool tips? Whatever it may be. I think the, t the great thing about the tech industry is there's no problem that doesn't have a solution. And if it doesn't have one, you build it and you inform it and you guide it that way. So I think it is a case that if it's, if it's a customer facing problem, you speak to the customer facing teams to try and prevent that. If it's something that there's some kind of validation you can have on a URL, if there's some kind of pop-up that can say, right, this is wrong, please try it again. If you can try and head out, it's the same thing as I'm saying here with the operational metrics, get it ahead of the problem as far up the stream as possible before it reaches the point where it's causing you the issue. So I think it's just trying to like remove the problem entirely or as again, yeah, talk to your user, your user experience team, to product management in terms of, right, this customer's consistently doing this wrong. Is there a way we can make the product more accessible to them in terms of guiding them in the right down the right pipeline for us? That would be the way I would go about it. Thank you. You can tell she's a professional. It's a much politer answer than I would have given. <laughs> All right, I think we're going to call the last question because I know I'm hungry. So I'm sure others are too. Okay. Yeah, sorry for holding these back. <laughs> yeah, I just had a question on like automation in terms of lazy engineer to lazy engineer. Mm -hmm. um, saving, I guess, engineers having to get up at night to look at alerts. Do you have any common alerts that come up that you have been able to automate or anything on your team? Again, I think it comes down to the fact that I try to avoid the automation and just fixing the problem at the root source. Um, in terms of the whole getting up in the middle of the night thing, obviously, like you know yourself, we work with teams in, in Sacramento and in LA, so they take the middle of the night and I take the middle of their night. But um, I think the, like, the most common ones that we've seen at the minute is where, say for example, you have two replicas up for a DB and the traffic's going all to one of them. Um, I, in terms of automating the solutions to these problems, again, I think it comes down to just fix the problem. Don't automate the fix, be the fix. Um, I, I'm a big fan of generative AI. I'm a big fan of automation and anywhere you can have it. People know that I have like um, bash aliases and bash functions for every little thing possible because I do not want to have extra clicks or extra key presses. But I, I think when it comes to operational metrics and automating um, resolutions to things, I want to know about those. I want to have the visibility into what's actually happening in my system so that I'm not surprised six months down the line when a customer's calling me saying, you, you've messed up here. So I think it's, I actually try to avoid the automation and just 
fix the problem at the root source. Like, um, I'd say most people here work for large tech companies that have quite big pockets. Generally, it can be scale something up, provide more instances, throw a little bit more money at the problem. Um, so I think that's part of what I would potentially go for is just fix the problem and don't automate the fix. That makes sense. Lovely. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. Yep.